Greetings, everyone. Thank you for attending the Baltimore Rotterdam Designing Cities webinar series. To begin with, to receive credits for attending this program, please click the link in the chat and fill out the AIA CEU form. I'm Christina Murphy, Assistant Professor at the School of Architecture and Planning at Morgan and Adjunct Professor at WAC, Virginia Tech. Today, Selena Abrams will moderate the talk, which will follow Fiverr Soar Off and Jan Jongert presentations. Last week, we went over concepts like pro bono work, giving time back to our community because our work is so impactful. We spoke, we spoke with two large architectural offices that build grand designs in the city, designs that do not go by unnoticed, hence the res responsibility of doing it right, doing it a bit more sustainable, yes, for the environment, of course, and yes, 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 for the people by designing with them. From February to April, we have presented eight lectures with today's nine featuring dynamic discussions among the cities of Rotterdam and Baltimore. Specifically, we had heard from design and policy, how design and policy can improve the, the built environment and provide access to all. Each week, two designers had discussed design topics from a social, spatial, and architectural point of view, specific to Rotterdam and Baltimore. Through conversations, we had explored if and how the environment is determinant to the failure or success of projects and what that means for the cities, the citizens, and their well-being. All of you are more than welcome to ask questions to Fiverr and Jan. Please do that. You can type your comments by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. This afternoon or evening's moderator is Selena Abrams. Selena is an urbanist and designer living in Die Ake, the Netherlands. She's passionate about citizen inclusion in urban planning and system transition projects. She's currently a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam, where she's studying collaborative planning and how to best include citizens within sustainability-driven urban planning projects. Her research seeks to uncover links between meaningful collaborations and multi-value creations using actions research, art-based research, and creative design methods. Selina was born in India, but since 2016, she's been living in the Netherlands and uh, where she studied urbaniz urbanism at the TU Delft. Selina, you, lead, um, you led a great workshop with Morgan and the Rotterdam Academy a few years ago. Please lead this last webinar of the series and uh, have fun. Uh, of course, thank you so much, Christina. Thank you so much for organizing uh, this wonderful event. Um, it's of course a bit a bittersweet to be the moderator of the last um, uh, lecture series in this entire um, um, event, uh, but I'm sure there is more to come from this uh, sister city collaboration between Baltimore and um, Rotterdam. Um, so today uh, I have the honor to introduce uh, Faiva Soraf and Jan, uh, Jan Joche, um, um, who are going to speak. Um, today uh, um, representing their respective firms. Um, to give you a, a sneak preview, um, uh, Fiverr will speak for uh, 20 minutes, uh, followed by Jan for another 20 minutes, and then we will have a, a, a lively, hopefully lively discussion of another 20 minutes uh, featuring questions from me as the moderator and also questions from you, the audience. Um, so I will start with Fiverr's introduction. Um, uh, speaking from uh, Baltimore, uh, Fiverr Sora has over 15 years of professional experience in architecture and design. Uh, as a senior associate with Design Collective, he has led architectural design teams for new construction in mixed use multifamily housing, student housing, retail entertainment, and academic facilities. Fiverr graduated from Hobart and William Smith Colleges in 2004 and received his Master of Architecture degree from the University of Maryland in 2008. And uh, from closer to home, Jan Jochert from SuperU Studios. Um, he is the co-founder and he designs interiors and uh, buildings and develops strategies to facilitate the transition to a more responsible society. He focuses on developing tools and processes and realizing tangible projects that empower local exchange and production thus creating an alternative to transporting and waste 
uh, uh, our resources, uh, products and components around the globe. Jan is fascinated with the behavior of flows in interior, industrial and urban environment. His work aims at shortcutting and interconnecting these flows as a means to create unexpected value. Key projects are Villa Velpelo, um, 2009, Harvest Map, 2012, Blue City Rotterdam, 2016, Pulse App China in 2018, and Resource Station uh, Africa Undermarked in 2020. Um, so um, uh, I will now give the floor to Fiverr, who will start his presentation. Thank you, Selena, and uh, thank you, Christina, for setting up this, uh, this great series. <clears throat> I've been with Design Collective since I graduated with my master's from the University of Maryland about 14 years ago. Um, and it's been, a, it's been fascinating to watch the, uh, the trajectory of the firm uh, in the time that I've <clears throat> been here. Um, we've broadened our national exposure, but we've still maintained a, uh, a presence in the city of Baltimore. Uh, which often gets overshadowed by its proximity to Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia. Um, so for those of you unfamiliar with our firm, um, Design Collective is a multidisciplinary firm with departments in architecture, interior, landscape design, planning, and graphic design. <clears throat> we work across multiple uh, project sectors, such as higher ed, uh, multifamily mixed-use housing, uh, student housing, um, and civic and cultural, just to name a few. But you'll learn from the following discussion that uh, this cross-disciplinary approach is, is really the, the backbone to our design ethos. Um, I've had the pleasure of working on projects across the country, across multiple disciplines, all of which have had their challenges and learning moments. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, when we complete projects in, in the cities in, that we live in, in our own backyard, and you get to see the uh, everyday impact of our efforts, um, it's really something special. And despite the firm's growing um, national presence in the built environment, I can still look out our office windows and see many of the iconic buildings that line the Inner Harbor that have been created by Design Collective over the years. So when Christina Murphy reached out about presenting some of the work that we've done around Baltimore, I instinctively started planning around the landmark buildings that we've been so fortunate to design and have built. <clears throat> but while we're working on a larger scale projects, both nationally and in Baltimore, um, today, I chose to focus on two smaller recent projects that both use built form and landscape intervention to create a stitch in the fabric of the city at, at both the macro and micro scales. Um, both projects either infill empty lots in the existing urban fabric or replace buildings that have been condemned and are beyond the ability for adaptive reuse. Um, there are so many places within the city of Baltimore that are desperately searching for place and identity. And having a multidisciplinary approach where comprehensive urban planning and landscape design are highlighted in the projects can be instrumental in rooting a building in its context. But the first project I'm gonna speak about um, is just wrapping up construction and serves as a stitch at the, the macro scale between the aggressive development of Under Armour's headquarters in Port Covington down to the south here. Um, and it, it kind of stitches the gap between Federal Hill and South Baltimore, just to the north, um, which were historically working class neighborhoods of row homes with strong ground level retail as you move towards the heart of the city. You can see from the, the project site here that <clears throat> there's some challenges as it's bordered to the south uh, with Interstate 95 uh, with an underpass connecting down to uh, Port Covington campus. Um, and to the north, you have the, the vibrant residential neighborhoods of South Baltimore and, and Federal Hill. And the immediate challenges were to develop a design that was both respectful to its context, but also introduced a strong moment of arrival to the city of Baltimore coming from the south. So, the view of the site shows the, the existing condition is a, a pretty sad street frontage with a distinct lack of walkability and, and street activ activation. 
The view at the bottom left is coming from Port Covington at the south, passing under 95. Um, the view at the top right is once you've passed under there, traveling north on South Hanover Street, the site is on your left, uh, and you start to get a, a feel for the, the South Baltimore row home neighborhoods. Um, the site itself um, really gave us many form givers and contextual clues that we could draw from in the development of our design. Uh, to the north, obviously, you had the, the residential character of South Baltimore with the, uh, with the standard row home um, inline neighborhoods. Um, so we, we looked at that and we kind of, we analyzed the typical row home, the, the anchor kind of tower elements at each end of the block and the kind of systemic marching repetition, uh, as well as the, the walkout nature of the stoops. At the south and west end of the site, you had more of an industrial feel with the, the CSX lines, um, already some adaptive reuse of the, uh, the warehouses occurring and being tr transferred to residential. Um, and you see some of the, the oil refineries as well, just off to the west here. And, you know, I, I would be remiss not to mention the, the rooftop character and these rooftop terraces in South Baltimore that, that everyone takes such pride in. Um, you, you have such great views of, of downtown, Fort McHenry to the east, and uh, the, the harbor to the, uh, to the northeast. And, and the last kind of form giver and generator, generator that I'd like to talk about are these kind of mid-block setbacks that are highlighted in orange that break down the, the scale of the street and kind of these long, relentless rent lengths of uh, row homes. And, and you could imagine, you know, in the past them being filled with great gardens uh, and kind of a break in the streetscape that, that gave a little bit of uh, softness to the, uh, to the urban edge. But you can see in the slide in the top right, a lot of these have kind of been given back to concrete paving and there's, there's not a lot of greenery. So we started with our, our base massing and full build, of, build, out, build out of the project. And we started to think about how can we break down the scale of this and, and replicate that, that mid-block setback, um, really to, to break down the scale of the block, but, but also to provide a little bit of um, buffer and, and softness to that edge. And once we did that, we, we kind of came up with this idea of, of drawing the internal privatized courtyard out to the street to really make a strong connection and give a front door presence to the building. Then looking at the, the internal program, you know, the, the uh, amenity space for these buildings, we thought, could this be this larger element that's projected out of the facade and maybe it's two story and creates this very porous connection back to the courtyard to really reinforce that concept. And then talking with the, the local residents and, and our, our developer that we were working with, there was a, uh, a, an idea of having eyes on the street, really adding some life to the streetscape 24 seven, both with a component of retail to serve the neighborhood and the residents of the building, um, but, but also just to, to really activate that ground plane. And then finally establishing an identity at the corner and really letting that rise up to the rooftop and, and kind of anchor the building as this iconic nod back to the, the roof terraces of the downtown South Baltimore. So we, we, we took these kind of contextual ideas and started from party diagrams and worked one way and then brought it back the other way from a sense of scale of the neighborhood to break down these kind of larger facades. So going back to the site, um, you'll notice that there is a distinct lack of trees in this neighborhood. Um, there's very hard edges. Cars tend to drive too fast on this road. Um, and we started to look into this a bit because we really wanted to break down the street section working with our landscape team. And what we found was that typical through these neighborhoods, especially on South Hanover Street, there's utility easements that run under the sidewalks right up against the edge of the edge of the, the curbs. So that kind of dictated that there be no street trees, no buffer, no kind of separation of vehicular and pedestrian environments. 
Um, and, you know, I was, I was really proud of our team to work with both the city and our developer to propose this idea of actually giving eight to 10 feet of property back to the city, moving all the utility easements inboard um, and really creating kind of mature trees with a, a strong buffer uh, to create good walkable neighborhoods. And also creating kind of a, a welcoming entry at the front door of the project. So th these are some initial renderings of the project. Um, the, the image on the left is kind of the, the southwest corner that invokes more of the, the industrial scale. Um, the top right, you start to see kind of walkout stoops, uh, a rhythmic marching across the building, as well as a, a, a nod to the, the, the rooftop terraces um, at the corner. And at the bottom right, you see the, this mid-block connection, uh, some attempts at traffic calming ideas, um, and all, really bringing in this kind of lush green connection to the, uh, the streetscape. So this project is just wrapping up construction. And unfortunately, we don't have pictures yet with active retail. And you know, I, I took these photos maybe two weeks ago, so it's still really cold here in Baltimore. So uh, hopefully, you know, we're looking forward to once this project fills out and serves as a catalyst for the rest of the community moving forward. So the next project I'd like to highlight serves as an urban stitch at more of a neighborhood-based scale. A few years back, we were asked to look at a site just off Johns Hopkins uh, University's Homewood campus, just north of downtown and the Inner Harbor, right up here. Um, Homewood serves as the primary undergraduate campus and has the feel of a traditional college setting in an urban environment. You can see the, the site just off to the right here. <clears throat> This is a slide from around 1920 in the early years of Homewood's evolution. But as you can see, it started to densify um, rather quickly through the 1950s. And by the 1990s, it had quickly evolved into a fully built out campus in a dense urban setting. One of the primary challenges over the years has been the strong physical barrier right here of Charles Street running north-south. Um, which really separates the heart of campus on the west side um, from the rest of Charles Village, which is to the east. Uh, the, the primary retail street is St. Paul Street, which runs north-south and, and parallels Charles Street. Um, and one of the primary goals early on in this project was to draw some of that energy off campus onto St. Paul Street, creating an active 24-7 live-learn environment. This is just an aerial view looking back at campus with uh, Charles Street in the foreground. And a view from the east looking, looking back to the west at, at Hopkins campus and our site, which uh, was a, an empty infill site. Buildings had been torn down in, in the 80s and it kind of remained this way for a long time. Um, we, we were looking at adding mixed use student housing to the site. Um, and the, the community engagement was, was really important, you know, listening to what the community felt they needed from this project. Um, and really the thing we heard over and over again was, you know, strong continuous retail at the base, um, which, which, create, which was great, but also created some challenges giving a kind of a, an iconic entry to the building if it was being given over to all retail. Um, obviously, there's a, a garage that we're wrapping on three sides with the housing up above. So this is a site plan of our, the proposed building. You can see we had, I think, 30,000 square feet of continuous inline retail along St. Paul Street. Um, we had a, a, a small two-story entry um, on 33rd Street. And as you get up to the upper floor, we, we kind of brought residents up immediately and brought our amenity space out to the corner of 33rd and St. Paul uh, to, to really activate that corner and give it some energy. Um, the, next slide, the next image to the right here is just your, your typical student housing floor. <clears throat> so as we got into kind of the, the design of this building, you know, we did what we always do. We stepped back and we, we looked at the context um, and started out with our allowable mass by, uh, by PUD. 
And to be a good neighbor to the buildings just to the south that were a little bit smaller in scale and set back from the street and to, to maximize kind of street light and air, we, we set back the east face, um, but still allowed the, the northeast corner to come down to the ground and, and anchor the corner of uh, St. Paul and 33rd. Then we looked at introducing that continuous retail base based on our, uh, our neighborhood discussions and bringing in kind of a, a rhythm and contextual bay language that, that jived with the, the traditional buildings in, in its immediate context. We brought the scale down of those bays and our top reeds um, to a line of cornice lines and, and really be a good neighbor, um, as well as creating a, a strong base middle top, which is very prevalent in this neighborhood. And, and the last idea was kind of these, these nodes or these moments within the building where there could be strong internal connection back to the community. Um, these were thought of as, as kind of resident amenity spaces for the students or student lounges. Um, the two on the top left were the highest points in the building and they had great views back to the, the skyline in downtown Baltimore. Um, and the one on the right here was, was elevated about a third of the way up the building uh, to really give a strong connection back to the heart of campus. Um, Hopkins primary campus is elevated about 25, 30 feet to the west here. So when students are leaving campus, there'd be a strong visual connection, as well as when students were in there, you know, studying, they'd still have that visual connection back to, back to their campus. So we, we went into our typical sketches and massing studies to kind of feel this thing out and see what feels right. Um, study the, the front door of the building and, and how do we have kind of a, a grand front door that's double height, but still really ties into the, the feeling of the retail with our amenity space. And as we typically do with most of our projects, we, we create these small vignettes to, to really sell the client and the university on, on our ideas here um, and get them excited, you know, about the front door experience, about this layering and terracing of energy on the 33rd Street. Um, these amenity student lounge spaces up at the skyline and also how the retail is gonna be transformed and activated by the depth of the street, the, you know, the thickness of the trees. Um, and then it, it's really fun to look back on these things and, and show the initial kernel of an idea and, and how it transfers into reality. Both of these, these sky lounges and also at our, our entries at the, at the front door to the project. So as you can see, we, we ended up with a clean lined contemporary design that was informed uh, and respectful of immediate context. Uh, but the other half of the, uh, the design and possibly the most impactful is the reimagining of the streetscape by our landscape team. Our landscape team proposed realigning traffic lanes, giving the street section a road diet from seven lanes down to five, and creating a strong walkable and bikeable environment that was no longer dominated by the car. The introduction of mature street trees and lush bioretention basins created strong retail pedestrian buffers that laid the foundation for a vibrant streetscape. Once again, you know, we, we studied in vignette how this could be transformative to the area. These are kind of quick vignettes looking at, you know, introducing this boulevard and these bike lanes separating the, the seven lanes of cars and, and how that translates into reality, you know, with these big mature trees that on day one really, really transform the environment. So going back to kind of where we started, um, you know, there, there was no there there. It was struggling for an identity it wanted some a vibrant environment. It had this uh, strong note of, of you know, activation just to the west with this heart of campus. And you know, it, it just goes to remind you that not every building has to be a hero to be, have an incredibly strong impact in its neighborhood and its surrounding community. Uh, with that, I will pass it over to Jan if you are ready. Thank you. Selena, you're muted.
Oh, sorry. Um, Jan, um, uh, Fiber, you can switch off your video now. Um, and um, yeah. Jan, um, the floor is yours. Okay. Start my video. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Very happy to be with you um, and uh, sharing the story from Rotterdam. Um, I myself, uh, I'm Jan Jongert, one of the founders. Um, like you've been introduced, it's nice to tell that um, I actually graduated at the Academy of Architecture uh, in 2003, that is uh, uh, co-hosting this event. Um, for uh, this evening, I'm, uh, or the, my evening, sorry, uh, for the, today, I'm uh, going to tell a little bit about the uh, perspective that uh, we've built up as an office. Uh, SuperUse uh, started in 1997. So we are already uh, operating for almost 25 years and took uh, quite a specific approach towards uh, our built environment and design. And yeah, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, we're uh, in total uh, with uh, 21 uh, people. Uh, we have different locations. Uh, this is a team in Rotterdam, which is our headquarters. Um, and we are based in a former um, tropical swimming paradise. Um, I'll explain a bit more about that later, how we actually transform are transforming this into a hub for the uh, circular economy. Um, I started Subuse together with César Pere in the middle here, um, who uh, split off as Subuse on site. So whenever there is a, a dedicated project on site and, and a circular architect needed, he joins uh, in there and work on, works on self-sufficient uh, housing projects. In 2016, we also launched Subuse China um, from Beijing, running several projects um mainly in the in the south of china and um, as well we're um, represented in uh, the us by loriana ichibashi and she is uh, actually situated quite uh, close to you in washington and uh, since this year um yeah uh, working on several projects in uh, actually starting up several projects in california so we have an international base and the, the nice thing is we're independent companies, but uh, collaborate and uh, exchange and knowledge and developments that we are working on. And to give a good impression about uh, the way we work, I start with um, yeah, an, a resource that we are currently using. Um, and I'm not speaking about the green energy, which of course is uh, generated in larger and larger quantities but actually um, about the waste that uh, the green energy still is generating because uh, the turbines and especially the turbine blades never have been designed to be um, in a circular system. So they have been designed, um, made out of uh, materials that cannot be recycled at the moment. So they are uh, buried or uh, incinerated. And we see this as a really inspirational uh, component to design our environment with. So when we got the commission to design a playground in Rotterdam, uh, we actually adopted uh, five of these turbine blades and uh, created a very playful playground, um, also using the components and elements that already were on the site and that would still have another uh, lifespan. Um, so this is a playground we designed and realized in 2008, um, which uh, creates a lot of fun because these turbine blades create a lot of opportunities to play with and to sit at, at or on, uh, but also to sit in. Um, so this is a kind of a blob design architecture without uh, needing complex programs uh, to create it. It's actually given to us by the shape that this material um, uh, has. So, and the, the additional benefit is that we actually are able to uh, reduce the environmental impact drastically. So, if you compare our playgrounds to a standard playground, we are like 80% better off uh, in that way. Um, yeah, we uh, since then started uh, generating more designs like uh, urban furniture here next to the famous Erasmus Bridge in Rotterdam. 
um, which after a remake or makeover now as well uh, as well functions as a monument for uh, diversity. Or like this uh, next to the seaside, uh, parts of blades that we couldn't use in other projects were uh, turned into um, seating that protects you from the wind. Um, actually, this uh, new venture that we started, um, um, really focusing on the turbine blade repurposing, is called BladeMade, um, which we started with two partnering organizations, and that's launching uh, in different countries at the moment. So we're connecting the uh, companies um, actually putting up and dismantling uh, wind turbines with recycling companies and uh, the cities that um, actually need interventions and we uh, can use these turbine blades in, in order to materialize those. I hope the transitions are better at the moment. Uh, they're much better now, thank you. Good, okay. Good. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm 50 years old. I'm wearing glasses, uh, but uh, uh, actually what I show you uh, with this slide are the two glasses that SuperUse is wearing when uh, we're looking at our environment. Um, so on the one hand, the, the left circle uh, you see is actually since uh, my year of birth, um, we every year are excavating and sourcing more, mining more than the earth can build back. So um, this is called Earth Overshoot Day. Um, so that's uh, showing how much actually that we're uh, excavating too much. On the other hand, what we mine, uh, a big part of it is wasted. Uh, this is uh, on the right side, you see a, a graph by a Canadian organization show you, showing you an indication of the total loss of value globally of materials that we are wasting okay um so for yeah for if you missed it on the on the left side the earth overshoot day um, every year uh, earlier in the year the big uh, yeah we're mining too much and on the other hand we're also wasting too much uh, losing real value in the resources that we are mining so our com our super use is really uh, trying to bridge this by creating new designs that on the one hand prevent uh, new uh, mining and on the other hand prevent loss uh, because we are uh, actually reapplying uh, materials that already have been uh, turned into a function. And it also actually um, made us think of what could the world look like if we try to stop uh, the mining and stop wasting. So can we actually generate an environment that uh, is uh, still very functional, happy, inspiring with uh, these reduced amounts of wasting and mining? And uh, in order to do that, we need to know uh, the resources. So um, we mapped uh, after a couple of years working, we mapped the uh, resources in the Netherlands first that we knew that would be able to uh, uh, supply us with building materials and um, uh, turn that into a resource for other designers too. So we could use them within our own uh, company, but also uh, have other uh, companies use it. Um, an example, for instance, are cable reels uh, that um, live for five years and uh, that we turned into this villa in uh, 2008 in Enschede that was built out of uh, more than 60% of reclaimed materials from uh, the neighborhood of this villa. We also map all our resources and actually get really um, aesthetically use the materials that we find. So uh, one of the ingredients was an uh, industrial textile machine. It used to be a textile industry area, and this provided us with enough steel to build most of the uh, yeah, the, the main construction of the house. Also, again, especially with steel, uh, you're saving a lot of emissions and pollution that uh, if you compare it to uh, using and wasting new steel. And um, yeah, not just the, the construction, but as well, the whole interior has a large component of reclaimed materials that otherwise would be wasted. 
more recently, we uh, designed and built uh, Kevin, which is in Eindhoven. Um, it is a public function added to a, a building where all kind of uh, public activities are taking place. And this is really a place to um, create a bigger uh, bond for the local community there and to make exchanges possible and to have creative activities uh, moving. And we were hired as their architect um, and sourced uh, different locations, providing us with the different materials. And one of the main ingredients uh, were, was this uh, chicken farm that was uh, just about to be dismantled. Uh, we bought the wood and um, uh, changed the construction a little bit and turned it into a dismantable construction. And for this uh, application, we were able to have a 90% reclaimed material. So just the glass and the, the roof um, the layer on top of the roof uh, is new um, and all the other parts have been reclaimed. Well, this is um, how we look at our environment, but also we try to look at what kind of program and how can we make our buildings more uh, integrated, sustainable um, than just uh, providing the proper space with the with sustainable uh, materials. So uh, also we start to look back at history, like, uh, well, I showed you the, the modern turbines that are just designed for a single use and single purpose. Uh, we much more admire the, the 400 years old, uh, yeah, uh, classical windmills that both harvest energy are built with uh, bio-based materials. Uh, and are uh, designed to be taken apart and be put somewhere else. And also their program is in such a way that uh, apart from harvesting the energy, it also provides uh, kind of a factory, uh, sometimes a house or a shop selling the products that have been produced there. So this much more integrated system within one building, that's something that we try to realize uh, today. And I'm very... Um, um, yeah, a very uh, simple example of this is a, a renovation that we did for an air, uh, former airfield in the Netherlands, where we were hired by the Dutch State Agency of Real Estate to transform this building into a hub for, um, uh, for uh, new companies. And we minimally cut new openings, adding windows from a housing project that was dismantled, added um, energy um, uh, nests, the power nests on top of the roof and we store the energy uh, in salt batteries that don't have chemical components so it's a much more uh, sustainable way of uh, having your energy uh, stored um, so uh, here already we also think about the uh, yeah the addition of the energy layer and a material uh, like our component that is considered very ugly usually uh, these uh, window frames from housing, um, we uh, adapt them and by the design we turn it into, we create a new aesthetics, these really deriving from uh, the components as they come uh, from their former use. And we look at many different materials. So um, the next example I would like to show is a, is a material that we are uh, very fond of. It's um, uh, called contour sheet. It's actually what remains after an industrial process of cutting out uh, components for car industry, for instance. Any city has a couple of these that uh, provide uh, uh, yeah, components, uh, steel um, components to the industry. And after cutting these parts, uh, you have kind of standard sheets that um, normally are collected as scrap scrap steel, uh, the, the company producing it has, gets a scrap steel price. It's transported uh, to another um, uh, state or a nation even then uh, melted and then again produced into something, uh, for instance, a fence or a cladding. Um, we see the immediate value of this material. We pay more to the company that produces the waste um, and have a, a pre-production, uh, design the application, and then apply it um, to a facade, for instance, uh, in this waste collection uh, center in The Hague. 
So uh, here we were not the lead architect, but we actually consulted the architect in uh, the materialization, the, uh, yeah, the, the super use uh, materialization of this building. And um, like I said, we like to that our buildings also tell something about the program that is uh, taking place uh, in the building. So this is a waste collection center where uh, the inhabitants of the Hague bring their waste and sort it in different stages so it can be reused again. It was a municipal commission, uh, actually the first governmental uh, commission that really based the commission uh, criteria on the amount of um, otherwise wasted materials so we see a trend in the netherlands really um, yeah focusing more and more on uh, the circular design and architecture and um, yeah at the same time our job uh, it's our job to uh, create beautiful and aesthetic buildings with it and using the materials as they come So we apply uh, common um, materials for construction, maybe not a common source, but um, yeah, we re-adapt them to apply them there. But uh, in time, we also started looking at the other flows uh, that consist, uh, that our city consists of. So that's how we actually started to look at the ecosystem of cities, not just looking at building materials, but also at money flows, uh, energy, um, food, water and uh, logistics, to name a few. And as well there, we learn from uh, ancient uh, developments, in this case, uh, agriculture from China that has been de developed over uh, two and a half thousand years, um, which actually is an ecosystem uh, using different production processes like fish, uh, silk, uh, sugar, and uh, connects them in a way that they start to enhance each other. And that's a kind of environment that we are uh, trying to support with our architecture. Um, as well, in China, we got a, a, a big um, request um, in size to um, actually develop an urban environment, more or less a factory mixed use that uh, would be beneficial in the environment instead of creating uh, waste flows and using resources. So that's how we developed the resource valley, um, which is actually based on the connection of different companies and industries uh, using each other's waste flows. Um, in this case, it's a former uh, uh, water treatment uh, plant uh, that we are upgrading using the materials that can be used, uh, can be created by from a water treatment plant but also adding other program that starts to interact with each other um, and having the facade to exchange the different resources between the companies. So this is a, a kind of first attempt to uh, start uh, building an urban environment uh, based on our principles. Um, A little bit smaller, but uh, like I promised, uh, the, the Blue City, the environment where our company is based in Rotterdam. Uh, this is a smaller scale example where we're already testing this. This uh, was an empty uh, derelict building that uh, we found the investor for. Uh, we joined together with a couple of companies to um, actually build a circular economy hub. In total, it's 130,000 uh, square feet. Uh, we made a primary, yeah, preliminary design of what it could look like in the future, but actually started to develop this in a, a more dynamic way. This is what it used to be. Um, then we started uh, designing and kind of a new excavation, new routing through the building in order to make it more publicly accessible and giving more companies uh, space in this, um, yeah, this, this big uh, spaceship. So the first part that we completed was the offices part that also would generate start developing the other parts. Uh, but all the companies are actually circular startups or um, companies that are growing in this field. And again, this whole building, apart from that, we redeveloped the whole building uh, as well. All the components have been reused. So this is a 90% reclaimed materials up to lighting, etc. 
And the funny thing is that our design really derives from the components that we uh, find. So the sizes of the windows determine the angles of the, uh, the walls that you see here, also providing for uh, additional better acoustical qualities, for instance. And we map the different uh, resources we find, the amount of kilometers that traveled, where it ended up, and how much uh, CO2 savings actually we accomplished by um, turning these materials into a function in this site. Well, it's a, it's a really like a, a playground uh, for um, circular development. There's around 40 companies at the moment, some famous uh, fruit ladder that uh, develop a ladder from uh, wasted mangoes and another interesting for the building industry now just starting its first production is blue blocks from uh, turning uh, algae or seaweed into a, a building material, bio-based building material. And in order to support this, we have a lab, also a completely circular build that actually allows uh, companies to develop their new products uh, in, a, uh, in a circular way, experimenting with all kinds of bio, uh, bio ingredients. And then we map the results and how much, uh, how many tons of CO2 we actually saved by uh, turning it, yeah, building this uh, lab on a, in a circular way. The last um, insight I give is a project we're currently working on, um, which also actually shows something about the social component. Um, former um, uh, yeah, community building that was derelict and uh, actually an initiative by a group uh, of inhabitants from this city hired us uh, to turn this into uh, yeah, a collective housing project that is on many different levels uh, self-sufficient and um, um, in a, cir a circular so um, like 90 percent of the materials either were on the site or have been found uh, from our harvest map and this is now turned into a very uh, yeah um, exciting environment with a lot of green uh, water collection gardens uh, for these uh, inhabitants in total there will be around um, 70 people living here and all this within the very strict limits of social housing that we have in the Netherlands. So um, yeah, I think we can prove here that we are able to actually turn this way of materialization into uh, both um, aesthetic and social uh, sustainable environments that um, we hope will um, build our future. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Jan. Um, yeah, thank you for switching on your camera. Um, yeah, uh, Fiverr, uh, please join us as well. Thank you. Um, uh, I would like, uh, thank you both for your wonderful presentations. It was very inspiring. Um, I would also like to invite uh, more of our audience to uh, start adding their questions to the Q&A, but I will start with a few questions myself, um, if I may. Um, uh, both of you, um, so you both, uh, while Jan, you didn't explicitly say so, but I think you work quite in a multidisciplinary fashion, uh, working on um, closing different loops. Um, so Fiverr, you can begin. Like, how, what are the challenges that you may or may not face uh, working in multidisciplinary groups? How is it different from um, architecture as normal, if, uh, if I can say so? I, I think, <clears throat> thank you, Selena. Um, I think certainly with with multiple disciplines, there's there's another level of complexity that gets layered on, obviously. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think it really provides the opportunity to develop holistic projects, you know, projects that are really embedded in their site, embedded in their communities. Um, and, and there can be a common thread that's kind of drawn through the project from planning to landscape to interiors to signage um, that, you know, sometimes gets lost when, when you're, you're kind of working in isolation. And, you know, we always try not to work in isolation, um, but when you, when in our specific instance, where you have all disciplines under the same roof and there's a strong cross-pollination between the, between the practices, um, I, I think it makes it a lot easier 
than you know in a traditional delivery of a project when sometimes uh, the owner hires a, a interior architect say and they hold that contract and you know there's you try to have those discussions but it's not it's not quite as tight sometimes um yeah Ah, the same question for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. I, I hope. I, uh, oh, I'm I'm sorry, Jan. Um, could you set up your camera? Um. Yeah, it it, it works. Uh, there's some instability I see here, but um, I, I, uh, I'll switch it. Okay, like this. Um, so I think from the beginning, um, yeah, we've decided to work multidisciplinary. So also we are working, for instance, with um, interns or, or people graduating from industrial ecology, which is uh, much more looking at uh, the ecosystems and have a chemical, like a chemics background or biology. So um, I think we're working on developing a, a kind of new um, language and framework that is able to bind different um, and to, to connect different specializations instead of uh, keeping them separate. So it's something that's uh, still in progress, but um, uh, yeah, I, th I think very uh, challenging. Um, my next question is again for the both of you. I've been trying to find um, um, uh, identify commonalities between your presentation before I uh, ask individual questions. Um, but you're both international companies, um, but both dedicated to working in these respective cities in Baltimore and in, um, uh, of course, the Netherlands is one big city, I think. Um, so how do you uh, manage the challenges of um, expanding internationally, but also being true to the city that you work in? Uh, Fiverr, you can go first. So I, I think that's a that's a great question. Um, obviously, Baltimore is a, a slightly different market than some of the other larger uh, urban metros. Um, and you know, listening to Jan's presentation, you know, I, I was really excited. I mean, there's so many great ideas going on there, and we we do have a couple big adaptive reuse projects that that we've been doing. Um, one was a you know large tobacco warehouse down in North Carolina to to you know a Class A office, which is really exciting. And there's a lot of reuse of materials. And right now I'm working on a you know the the adaptive reuse of a um, uh, it was the the old cotton annex building down in D.C. Um, the Department of Agriculture and switching that over to to residential mixed use. Um, and you know those projects do happen in Baltimore, but they're not, not quite as often. Um, and there's definitely the, the, ability, the ability there and there's the, there's the stock certainly uh, to make it happen. Um, I think unfortunately demand really just needs to catch up with the ability for us to do a lot more of those projects in our hometown. Um, so the, you know, there's definitely similarities and, dis and differences across all you know metropolitan areas, um, but like I said, there's nothing like doing a project in your own hometown where you can really experience the impact you have. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, um, yeah, especially since I've been involved in actually setting up the international uh, offices. It's something I uh, yeah, personally experience. Uh, to me, it's a really like a great adventure, I would say. So it's uh, on the one hand, we're very strongly based yeah, already for uh, 25 years in Rotterdam. So um, we, yeah, every year are running at least a project in Rotterdam, either for the municipality or for a cultural venue or, um, yeah, so people um, know about this. And indeed, uh, it's great that you can, um, yeah, since you know the culture, you can really um, uh, adapt to it uh, quite easily. Um, one really nice project we're currently working on is a, is a resource uh, center for the market in, in Rotterdam, where actually after the market, uh, the waste is collected and then 
again um, shared with the uh, community of uh, entrepreneurs in in that area um, turning it to new, new products that can be sold on the market again and this is really uh, something that is possible when you're living there and you can actually fine-tune uh, pro uh, uh, projects and that's also why we thought it was important not to have a kind of uh, hierarchical uh, super use where uh, from Rotterdam we're running uh, all the different uh, uh, stations uh, in different countries but that they are really independent companies and that we can um, collaborate and exchange um, knowledge but that the local uh, Chinese or uh, American or can actually um, yeah work very closely uh, with the, the project and the, the clients and the community on site and I, th I think that kind of local uh, knowledge is is really very important to develop uh, uh, good projects I did have a question for Jan that, that I've been thinking about um, and sorry to jump the gun on you here, Selena, but it's, it's kind of the, the scalability of material reuse. Um, you know, some of the projects you showed were obviously single family, you're working with a small client and they may have more of an open mind to clad their building in reused woods or timbers or whatever you can find. And then scaling that up to kind of a larger scale project and convincing, you know, equity stakeholders and and all the people who get involved that you know a this is a great sustainable idea um it's it's great for the building it's great for the built environment um but also how, how do you convince them that that you know it's not a liability as well yeah there are some some uh, uh parts to your question i think one is the, is the practical one about uh, yeah is there enough material you can built with do uh, people want to live in such environments on a larger scale i think scalability usually has more to do with how something is financed than really can it be practiced so that's i think a, a difference one needs to to make there um, and since most of our clients are really have a um, yeah the, like the intention to to build um uh, a circular development i think uh, we are able to scale up as well in in the projects we're doing so in the beginning we had really small yeah like interiors of shops or uh the, this villa in enschede that i showed was really the first um building we created but actually since the dutch government also signed the the climate uh, agreement the paris climate agreement uh, and we have goals for 2030 and 2050 to be uh, completely circular. Now, larger uh, organizations like uh, yeah, the, the largest housing uh, corporation of, the, of Rotterdam that owns 50,000 houses in the city, they ask us to help them uh, building their strategy, how to do that in a circular way. And especially actually at the scale uh, of um, these housing corporations, um, renovations on one side can actually supply materials for renovations on other sides again. So by um, having enough knowledge and uh, knowing the, the resources that um, these buildings are made of, um, you can actually um, yeah, create a bigger scale. And then the other thing, I think what's interesting development that's happening is that um, in the Netherlands, we see a kind of growing demand for collective housing where actually the, the the more, uh, yeah, the, the developer as we know it, uh, who doesn't know his uh, clients yet or the, the inhabitants of the, the building he is uh, commissioning. Um, so needing to uh, minimize all his risks, we now see collective developments where actually the um, future inhabitants uh, co-develop with the housing corporation or uh, in their own community, um, their new housing and actually in that way also are able to lift the, uh, the amount of um, circular um, yeah, parts in, in their housing as well, because they actually want to live in such an environment. So the, uh, they take the risk for that as well themselves and they 
uh, also are uh, part of the of the development itself. Um, thank you, Jan. Uh, so I can imagine that there is also differences in local policy with a national policy and also cultural differences that maybe allow this to happen in the Netherlands. Um, uh, but um, Fiverr and Jan, because you're also opening your first offices in the United States, I believe. Um, do you see possibilities um, to do this in the United States? Could there be a harvest map for Baltimore, for instance? Because Fiverr, you said there are materials, there are you know, resources, but are there any policy challenges or cultural differences that you find would be a roadblock for, this, for such a map to, uh, to, do, to be developed? I'll jump in. I, you know, I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to Jan opening his uh, first studio over here. I think we could do some great collaborations. But you know, to your point, Selena, I, I think there are going to be some initial challenges, um, as as there always are when when you try and do anything new. Um, you know, the, the West Coast of the U.S. has been CLT has been using CLT for a really long time, and you know, we've been trying to push that in a lot of the our projects on the East Coast and, you know, you, you have builders or contractors that just aren't comfortable with it. And, you know, it, I think we're going to run into, we're going to run to the same things. That's not to say we're not going to get over that hump because I, I really, really hope we do because I, I think what Jan and his group are doing over there is, is really spectacular. And it, it really adheres to the tenets of sustainability um, as opposed to just checking check boxes. Yeah, I agree. I, I also see a lot of opportunities. Um, actually, we're um, having now a first development in, uh, in California that uh, where we are going to test our approach um, in um, five uh, urban villas. So that's going to be very challenging to also test this for the market. And the great thing there is that there is a developer who really wants to push the boundaries for uh, sustainable development so um, and yeah actually uh, involving us in order to uh, manage that and come up with uh, proposals so this is going to be very exciting and we are actually uh, planning to also uh, make a, a harvest map for that environment because that's what we see it starts with it's to like we did in the Netherlands you need to know the resources that uh, currently are wasted and undervalued and by knowing them, you can actually start to think uh, creatively about them as well. And uh, in some cases, uh, test them in reality, uh, maybe get uh, um, permissions also to uh, build with them. Uh, and some materials, you uh, are not more special than other uh, current building materials, just the, where they um, are sourced is a, is a different site. So, that's those are i think um yeah the, the, the first those are also the first materials that we will apply when uh, applying this strategy in in the us well so i do, great to, yeah. uh, sorry it would be great to have a uh, baltimore uh, uh, harvest map as well i think, I think it, uh, it would be interesting to to see what is uh, what is available um, yeah, uh, I really hope something like that could happen. Um, uh, I do think we're running out of time, so I will just um, uh, do the last comments. One of the comments from the audience was that it is a, fa a fabulous adaptive reuse and slash sustainability projects. I agree. Um, uh, Jan, uh, I really hope to see uh, more of those wind well blade um, uh, uh, seeds all over the Netherlands. Uh, I think that's a fantastic uh, typology to actually have um, uh, that also kind of um, represents the country. Um, and Fiverr, you also said not all buildings have to be hero buildings, but um, I know you typically work on landscape, uh, sorry, landmark buildings uh, in your company. But I think the kind of uh, transformation that I saw from what it was to what it it did turn out to be. I do think it's going to be a hero building for uh, the neighborhood uh, in the end. Um, uh, so thank you so much um, to the audience. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, Fiverr and Jan, I really hope to see uh, a Baltimore harvest map sometime in the, uh, in the future. Uh, maybe that's a collaboration possible. And I also think our speakers are extremely approachable and will uh, uh, answer to questions on LinkedIn. Um, and so please feel uh, free to reach out with more questions. Um, uh, that's it from my end. Uh, Christina, thank you so much for organizing this uh, the series. Your um, 
your thought, your attention to detail, and also getting the big picture is incredible. It's is incredible. So thank you so much. Um, I will uh, give the floor to you. Well, thank you guys. And I would like also to add that there is no compromise on designing. And this is something that Jan, it's a little secret that I really would like to have a one-to-one -one talk with Jan as a designer. How do you not compromise design? Fiverr, Jan, Selena, Andrew, on behalf of the whole audience, Baltimore, Rotterdam Sister Cities, our partners, AIA Baltimore and the Rotterdam C Academy von Valkunst, I would like to thank you. Thank you for making us truly understand your love for the city because it does transpire, transpire from your conversation. You really like the city where you live and you feel it necessary for your design. And when working on a project, thinking about the city as an overall entity and the citizen experience, giving back to the city and that uh, seems like a key to your work. Thank you for reflecting on what is available, be creative with it and truly give a new life to the energy that already exists and that we already have. Reclaim and do not waste and do not compromise on the design. Audience, please know that this is being uh, recorded. You will receive uh, a link to the record when, uh, if, you, if you sign up for this lecture, of course, and when the, and when the record is available on the YouTube channel of the Baltimore Rotterdam Sister Cities. Uh, YouTube channel. Please also remember that this lecture is qualifying for the AIACU. Um, so fill up the form and uh, receive your one LU credit. Again, thank you to all of you for being part of this and helping me to pull it together. This is the last of a series, which all of, all of them have been recorded. So you can go back and, uh, and reflect and look. I tried to humbly, humbly uh, the intention was to connect and make the Atlantic a little bit smaller and may, maybe make the urban connection a little bit larger and make uh, our awareness as designers on places and people very impactful. I hope we, uh, we did contribute a little bit. Again, good afternoon or good evening, whatever you are. Thank you for being part of this. Bye. Thank you.